Welcome to the Pace Moments Leaders in Business podcast. Here we interview thought leaders about finance trends, the evolving role of finance, and how our profitability analytics framework can help you. Hello, I'm Rafe Lawson, Executive Director of the Profitability Analytics Center of Excellence. And I'd like to welcome you to this podcast on thought leaders in finance. And today I have the honor and pleasure of speaking with Prashant Sodhakal, who is the leader of the DBP Institute. So uh, welcome, Prashant. And perhaps let's, we can start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Riff. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hi, everybody. My, my name is uh, Prashant Sothikal. I was born and uh, raised in India, and uh, I did my studies and uh, my master's program in India. And uh, uh, after my master's, I was hired by Procter & Gamble for their office in Brussels in uh, Belgium. So that was the first time I left my country, and that was also the first time I actually sa sat in an aircraft. Before that, I never sat uh, in an aircraft uh, till I was 26. Uh, so I went to Belgium, and I worked there for almost four years, and uh, I had to move back to India for family reasons. And I came back uh, to India, and I joined uh, G and uh, later SAP, moved to SAP. And uh, SAP transferred me for a project to Calgary in 2009. And uh, after a couple of years in uh, in the pro working in the project in Calgary, I quit SAP and I started my own company, which is uh, DBP Institute, which stands for Data for Business Performance, which incidentally is the title of my first book. And uh, and the word institute is basically offering best practices to the industry based on uh, based on what I have seen in uh, what I've seen and research so on and so forth. Um, apart from my consulting pursuits, I have a PhD from ESLL in uh, France, an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management, uh, and I also recently pursued, uh, completed my ICD dot designations from the University of Toronto, uh, the uh, Institute of Corporate uh, Directors. I've written uh, three, uh, uh, two books. The third one is uh, is on the way: uh, Data for Business Performance and Analytics Best Practices. In fact, Analytics Best Practices was ranked as the best analytics book of all time in uh, May of 2022. Uh, and I'm also an adjunct professor of data analytics in IE Business School in uh, Spain. And I sit on the editorial boards of uh, MIT's uh, uh, Chief Data Officer Symposium, uh, Astral Insights, uh, and uh, BGV, which is a Silicon Valley uh, uh, VC firm, and Grossoft, which is based in Bangalore, India. Well, it's uh, certainly... A lot of things you're involved with. You're a very busy guy. I can see that. Yeah. And your institute recently published uh, a 2023 uh, data analytics prediction report. And could you tell us yeah. some of the highlights of that? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Ray. Once again for Pace uh, so supporting this uh, supporting this project. Yeah. Um, every year we are coming up with this 2020 uh, or the following years uh, predictions and prescriptions. We we don't just talk about predictions. We also tell the community what they can do to be better prepared to harness the value of these pr uh, predictions. We started this in 2020, 2021, and 2022 as well. So three years in a row, we are coming up with this uh, 10 data analytics predictions and prescriptions. Even this year, we came up with this report and uh, we have 10 predictions in the four key stages of the data analytics lifecycle. The first one is data management, number two, data integration, number three, data science, and next number four, decision science. So we look at the four, all four domains of data analytics, uh, data analytics uh, lifecycle. And within each of these insights or each of these 10 insights, we give a background why we believe this, is, this, is, uh, this matters. Uh, number two, the rationale as well, the reasoning behind this prediction. And lastly, the prescriptive recommendations for each of these uh, predictions. In this year, we have been slightly different. In fact, we came up with two additional uh, uh, elements in the report. The first one is the 12 key capabilities the organizations should uh, invest in to leverage this uh, data analytics capabilities and predictions, number one. And next, number two, the five key elements of a project they should identify before embarking on this journey. So we came up with these two other uh, uh, aspects uh, um, as well. So this report is free, just like all good things in life are for free. This report is for free. Nobody need to pay anything because a couple of companies sponsored this work and, um, and, and everybody can uh, get it either through LinkedIn or they can drop me a note and uh, get access to this 35 page report. Oh, that's great. Uh, definitely looking forward to perusing it. And uh, maybe just uh, now discussion a little bit. And 
where do you see the future of finance going, especially with regard to data and analytics? Yeah, so interesting question. In fact, it's a hot question everybody keeps asking, uh, given that majority of the consulting projects we do are, uh, are for the finance and supply chain uh, community. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little bit of context, I look at the definition of data analytics mainly for measurement and performance improvement and the decision-making surrounding it using data. So we talk about the culture of data analytics. Many of my clients and prospects ask me, hey, Prashant, what do we do to build that culture of data analytics? So I tell them, fundamentally, the culture of data analytics is all about measurement and improvement. If you don't believe in the concepts of measurement and performance, you are not going very far with data analytics. So with that background, so we are, I'll explain the question of future of finance. So when we look at the future of finance, if you look at the measurement continuum, we have identified eight stages in the measurement continuum. On the left side, which is very immature, it's all about anecdotes, it's all about stories. So oh, I believe this is what is happening, so on and so forth. On the right hand, which is the extreme st uh, stage, it's all about predictions and prescriptions so that we are better prepared to harness these opportunities. Sadly, majority of the organizations are on the left side which is all about anecdotes, which is all about reactive reports, and very few of them are talking about kind of a regular report, which could be a dashboard or, or even a conventional BI report. 85%, Gartner came up with this report, and they said that 85% of the companies are not talking about the remaining five stages. They are all in the first three stages, which is about stories, which is often mostly wrong most of the times. Next number two, which is about uh, uh, reactive reports. Like the CEO comes in the morning and says, I want this report. Then the whole company drops everything and runs behind this report. And sometimes they have this weekly dashboard, which is coming, So which is on historical performance. So very few companies are talking about the futures, which is about associations, correlations, uh, uh, outlier analysis, which is conjoint analysis, uh, predictive analytics, prescription, optimization, scenario planning, sensitivity analysis, very few companies are doing that kind of work. So the future of finance, in my view, has to be to leverage that leverage that future, which is the remaining five elements as well, if they have to get the full value out of data analytics. And what is that that you need to get those value? Three main things in our experience. Number one, the culture of data and analytics. Next, number two, literacy, which is education. How do you harness this value? And the third thing is good quality data. So we have we have done this study and we are not just our research, even validated this with quite a few industry experts, actually 147 of them. And this is what we found. The three key capabilities required to get the value of data analytics for finance is number one, culture, number two, education, number three, uh, good quality data. Hey, well, thanks for those three enablers. <laughs> and uh, a related question then would be, what would be the challenges and opportunities for uh, including data analytics in finance? Can you, can you give some examples of that? Yeah, so if you're, that's what, and extending to all those uh, things, the the eight measurement, uh, uh, ele eight elements in the measurement continuum broken down into the three types of analytics, which is descriptive, what happened, predictive, what will happen, and prescriptive, what are the factors which will cause a particular event to happen. Majority of the work that is happening these days in finance is, uh, is on descriptive analytics, which is on historical performance, so on and so forth. Very few companies are talking about the other two, which is about prediction, including emission learning, and the prescriptive analytics, which is about uh, optimization, scenario planning, sensitivity, sensitivity analysis, so on and so forth. So these are the things which uh, finance can look at to get more value out of data analytics. But I also want to tell one thing, uh, uh, Rafe, about the finance community. So of all the domains which I've seen, I have seen that the finance uh, community, especially is the one which is best positioned to get value out of data analytics. They might have constraints, no doubt, just like businesses have constraints, the finance community also has constraints, but of all the domains, they are in the best position to get value out of data analytics. Why? For me, three, uh, three reasons. Number one is they are inherently comfortable working with data. Like for example, if you look at regulations, whether you talk about GAAP or IFRS and all those things, they are pretty much data centric. And finance community have a knack of working with data to make this happen. So they have already have the majority of the skills that is needed to work with data and analytics, next number one. Next number two, 
is when you talk about data analytics, often somebody creates the data and you use it to derive insights. So you need to collaborate with the people who are looking at that first stage of the data analytics lifecycle, which is data management, creation and origination. So often if you look at the uh, entities which are going to hit the GL, it's coming from sales, it is coming from marketing, it is coming from supply chain, procurement, so on and so forth. But finance takes a ownership of the data and makes sure that the data is neat and clean for reporting. So they have a knack of collaborating with different stakeholders, talk their language and getting things done. So that's the, another thing about finance uh, people. The third thing, good thing about finance is they know how to work on KPIs. So when you talk about KPIs, which is the fundamental thing of data analytics, finance, uh, pace, and all those things, they know to talk the language of KPIs and use those KPIs to get business results. So if you ask me who, who are the people who are going to get best, who are in the best position to get value out of data analytics, it is finance. They have constraints, true, but they are in the best position to get value out of data analytics and be kind of the, uh, the front runners in this, in this transformational journey. <laughs> well, that's great to hear because, you know, I was under the impression that areas like marketing were way ahead of uh, finance and use of analytics. So it's good to hear that uh, the future of finance uh, is, is, is uh, along that path as, as well. Yeah. So, uh, so at the Profitly Analytics Center of Excellence, we have our Profitly Analytics Framework. Now, I wonder if you could talk a little bit how that fits in with your work. Okay. So, you know, as I said earlier, our company, we do three main things. Number one is consulting. Next, number two is education or training. Number three is research, like the 2023 report, which came up is part of our research, uh, research uh, stream. So when we look at our consulting work, we have a methodology, which is called as the power of one. So people might say, what is this power of one? So this actually came from uh, a book called Atomic Habits, which is written by James Clear where he uh, talks about the story of the British cycling team and how they were very poor in cycling and in the Rio Olympics, how the coach used the power of one and made the British cycling team one of the best uh, performers and got a lot of gold medals. I don't know how many medals. And the same thing continued when the, in the British cycling team. So it's about one, 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 impro one improvement at a time. So what is that in terms of finance, in terms of business? What do you mean by the power of one? So we tell our clients, you don't have to have some very big goals. You can talk about 1% improvement in one iterations. So that one could be a 1% increase in price, 1% increase in customer service, 1% reduction in costs, 1% reduction in inventory, or a one iteration, which generally is about six to 12 weeks. That's a sweet spot we have sp spoken about. So most of the time, if you can get this one unit improvement, which could be whatever that one person price, profitability, so on and so forth, using one iteration with six to 12 weeks, you are going to get value out of data analytics. So that's a methodology which we are, which we are working on. So recently we finished a project for a, for a big chemical distributing company in Seattle, and we implemented the power of one, and we came up with 20, 20 recommendations as part of the million insights, which we derived using their data and interviews. And we came up with the 20 recommendations, which was all centered around the power of one, so that these are the 1% improvement which you can do, improvement in uh, price, improvement, uh, reduction in cost, so on and so forth, and get value out of data analytics. So overall, when we talk about data analytics, most of the clients talk about very lofty goals. I said, good, good that you are thinking big, but let before thinking big, let's think small, go fast, and reach there. So the Profitably Alex framework is based on three domains. And this isn't a question, this is just an observation. Uh, revenue management, uh, financial costing, and investment management. And it's it's a quite a comprehensive uh, framework for organizations to improve their profitability. And I've always thought that it is too broad for uh, an organization to implement the whole thing initially. And, you know, as any change management effort, you want to have your early successes and, you know, a firm might start with uh, working on its, proving its manual costing system. And so along the lines of what, what you're saying, if you have improvements in some aspect of your costing or 
or, or in terms of your revenue, management of your revenue or even in your investments, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a great approach because you have this power of one and, and uh, you're showing the improvement in your organization's profitability. So that, that's, that's an interesting uh, concept. Okay, so coming back to the PACE, uh, PACE framework, uh, Rafe, let me give you a simple example about uh, one of the three key, um, uh, pay, uh, PACE pillars, which is revenue management. So recently we did a project uh, for a chemical distributing company in the US, and one of the challenges they had is about growth. And we incidentally in uh, DBPI, we did a similar study, and we found that the biggest uh, factors that are affecting the company's growth as part of data analytics is about revenue forecasting. So that tied up very well with our values, with our research, and of course the need from the client which we had, which is to come up with the revenue forecasting. So we started the project, and uh, in the first meeting we asked the uh, company, uh, we asked the people in the room, hey, tell us about the price elasticity of demand for your products. So again, when we look at the measurement continuum framework, most of the time it's about the anecdotes. Oh, I believe this is what is happening, so on and so forth. So they said, our products are very inel inelastic. I said, that sounds very surprising. You are selling sugar. How can that be very inelastic, especially in, in this today's world? So let's see what the data is saying. But when we look at the data, it was completely other side. It was an elastic product, which makes sense. Our hypothesis said that it is an elastic product. So we went back and said, hey, guys, you have been running the business for years together. Now look at your hypothesis. It is completely or your understanding is very different from what data is talking about. So, the, so that's what I said, that measurement continuum. Many of the companies are having some beliefs and they run the companies based on beliefs, whereas data might come up with completely new insights on, uh, on, uh, on, on revenue management, which is one of the pace pillars, or it could be on cost mitigation, or which is also on risk. So when you talk about data analytics from, uh, from a company's growth perspectives, we are looking at three major things, increase revenue, reduce cost, and mitigate risk. And this is one example where I have where data analytics can even question or invalidate some of the existing assumptions or beliefs which you have in your company so that you can go forward from here. Well, that's a great example. I think uh, too many companies are run by uh, those beliefs that have never been really tested uh, empirically. So that's yeah. a great example. Yeah, and data analytics, one thing is, and the future of finance and pace and all those things, it also helps you to be humble. Uh, like you might be the greatest star in the world, but at the same time, the rate at which things are changing in the business, you might be very open to accept that my understanding or my experience, which is all I have gathered for decades, might be invalidated because of the way things are going. And how do you invalidate or invalidate it is by using data analytics. It also teaches you to be humble and be open for new insights that are coming. Yeah, and that's, that really ties in well with PACE because we believe in causal economic, developing causal economic models of the organization. And you know, so many finance functions have um, models that really don't, that don't tie into operations. And it's based on this belief that they accurately reflect the, uh, impact of various drivers and and again so many organizations have models financial models that 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 don't that that really cannot accurately forecast uh, the organization and again uh, it's because they have these uh, models that they've built that have not been empirically tested that have no grounding in the in operational understanding of the organization and that's again pace something that pace uh, really emphasizes in our Profitably analytics uh, framework. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, where do you see the uh, the analytics domain going? What what kind of what changes do you see in the future? Yeah, uh, a, a couple of things. I'll break this down into two major streams. One is on the technology side. Next is on the business side. Uh, on the technology side, I see most of the uh, going forward, the role of artificial intelligence is going to play a big role. And one of the key ingredients to make AI work is good quality data. And that's where the business aspects are very important so that you have the right culture, you have the right training or the skills to manage good quality data. And again, the quality data, data can come from two major streams. One is discrete where people are manually creating it 
or it could be automated, where it is coming from devices like the IoT sensors, so on and so forth. So one aspect of uh, AI, which is, uh, which is good quality data, is very important to make AI work. So there's going to be more and more AI coming, and there's going to be more and more automation, especially in data management and data capture, so that these AI algorithms work well. So that's number one. Next, number two, is uh, the people aspects where you get a lot of insights. The one thing is, before you want to run like Usain Bolt, you must want to make sure that you can uh, crawl and walk. So it's all good to talk about AI, but the fundamental thing about AI is making sure that you are in control of things. And that's where the cit concept of citizen data scientist, which is a role coined by Gartner, and I'm a big believer in that, because the people who are closer to business and data are the ones who are in the best position to get value out of data analytics. So uh, that's number two. So more and more people have to be skilled in, uh, in, uh, in understanding how data analytics works so that they can leverage the power of AI. So in the next three to five years, what I, what I see, Rafe, is two major things. One is the proliferation of AI technologies, number one. Next, number two, the uh, emphasis on upskilling the business people to leverage the technology and data to make things happen. This is not my observation. Yesterday I was reading a report from Gartner. They say 2023 is going to be the year of upskilling. And I think Pace is going to play a big role in this as well. Um, so the, this is where I see the future is going to be AI and building the right skills so that you leverage the power of AI. So the biggest enabler for change, you, you spoke about change just a few seconds back as part of your questions. The biggest enabler for change, in my view, is education, is skilling. If people don't have the right skills, the change is very difficult to embark on. Well, we've had some uh, good questions in dialogue here. Wanted to ask some, a couple more, more personal questions, and uh, maybe you could share any key lessons that you've learned in your professional and personal journey, because you've certainly had an interesting uh, trip so far. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'll talk about my uh, the, the personal or the leadership journey, which which I which I'm which I've learned and I'm learning as well. Just because I'm saying something doesn't mean that I'm a guru in this. I'm also learning, and when I say something, it's a reminder for myself that I don't forget my lessons. Uh, my leadership lessons are basically uh, I call them as three piece of leadership. Uh, the first one is patience. And the next number two is uh, uh, is uh, persistence, and next number three is positive thinking. Uh, so uh, every, every big thing takes time to achieve. You can't achieve things overnight. So you need to be a little bit patient. And during that uh, process of being patient, you need to be persistent with your uh, with your goals. So persistence matters a lot. And uh, at the same time, when you have some good, decent goals it's not going to be smooth. The journey is not going to be smooth. There's going to be a lot of obstacles as well. So you need to have the right positive thinking so that you don't give up, uh, you don't give up so soon. So this is my, <laughs> this is my personal uh, uh, leadership philosophy, the three P's of leadership. <laughs> I, I think I may adopt that for, for pace because we, uh, we, we, there's a lot we try to accomplish, a lot of education that we need to, to, uh, to, uh, help folks uh with and it's it's taking a lot of patience we're we're being very persistent uh, <laughs> and we're positive that we can achieve our goals <laughs> yeah uh, those are three great uh, uh lessons right there so just uh you know wrapping up perhaps you had mentioned your your third forthcoming book and uh maybe you'd like to just tell us a little bit about that yeah, th thanks. Uh, thanks Ray, for, uh, for bringing this up and giving me an opportunity to, to talk about my book. Uh, my third book, which is published by Wiley, which is uh, Data Quality, Empowering uh, Business with Analytics and AI, uh, will be out uh, next month on February 7th. In fact, it came to the Wiley warehouses uh, yesterday and uh, the shipment to all the bookstores are happening as we, as we speak. Um, but there are many books on data quality. Let's be open with this and fair here. But people might uh, think, why one more book on data quality? What is special about this book? The, the, in this book, I talk about 16 key issues of data quality and 10 best practices companies can do to remediate the issue of data quality and sustain it. 
So this is very uh, prescriptive based on my experience consulting for almost 80 different companies in my three decades of my career. So it is from a practitioner to a practitioner. So it's not about uh, theory. It's not about a quality is important and all those things. Everybody knows that. So now they want solutions. So this is about prescription solutions based on industry best uh, practices, based on a framework, which I call it as DARS. So there are 10 chapters in this book, and it is broken down as part of the DARS framework. DAS stands for define, analyze, realize, and sustain. So the, 10 cha uh, or the 12 chapters in this book are part of this four phases where we are looking at the 16 key reasons why data quality issues happen and 10 solutions based on industry best practices and what companies can do to, uh, to fix it. And another thing which I want to tell you, which is about my personal thing as well, the, the, uh, the royalties from all the books I have, I have been getting are given for charity. So, so far I have been, uh, I have given almost like $8,000 of uh, all the royalties, 100%, which is about $8,000 to charities such as uh, the, the Red Cross, which is to support the victims affected by the Ukrainian war, um, which is for the Canadian Cancer Society, brown bagging for Calgary's kids so that the Calgary kids don't go to school hungry. So we have given almost $8,000 or I have given almost $8,000 from the book royalties. So again, even on from the royalties from the third book as well, we'll go for charity. So this is a great opportunity for people to learn as well as to give. So <laughs> there you go. Well, that's 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 very commendable of you, and uh, sounds like an interesting book. And so I think with that, we'll wrap up this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, Prashant. It's been a very interesting uh, and engaging conversation. And you know, good luck with your uh, yeah, that book. And okay. Your future. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Ray, uh, Ray, for the opportunity, and it has been great collaborating with uh, Pace and other experts uh, as part of the Pace Network. Uh, thanks for the time. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to our Leaders in Business podcast. To learn more about profitability analytics, check out the Pace website, join one of our interest groups, and follow Pace on LinkedIn and Twitter.